Hi, welcome to Skip's Corner, where I cover Nashville's baseball history and events and introduce you to players, coaches, and other fans. There are many, many names that are remembered by Nashville Vols fans, mostly players like Buster Bogusky is often mentioned, Carl Sawatsky, Jim Maloney and Jim O'Toole, and even going back further like Kai Kai Kyler and Newt Fisher. Those are great names tied to Nashville's baseball history. And then there are some non-players whose names are often tied to Nashville baseball. For example, Grantland Rice, who named the Nashville Ball Club the Vols, or Volunteers, it was shortened to Vols in 1908. And he called Sulphurdale that for the first time. It used to be Athletic Park until he dubbed it Sulphurdale. The name stuck. Faye Murray in 1930 was very popular. He was an owner, bought the club, and in 1939, the first year of Larry Gilbert, saw a championship in the Southern Association for the first time in many years, And again, in 1940, Larry Gilbert led the club to not only the Southern Association Championship, but also the Dixie Series Championship, which was a series of games against the Texas League champion. And then in 1941, Faye Murray passed away and his son carried on. And that was a long time history for Nashville baseball and leading the club as an owner. Larry Gilbert is a non-playing name. He coached from 1939 through 1948 and then became the general manager through 19. 55, I think, or through midway through 1955. And those are great names. But a name that everybody remembers, everybody wants to talk about, is Larry Munson. And I kind of want to tell you a little bit about him. I've been looking into his history. His name was Lawrence Harry Munson, born on September the 28th, 1922. I found out that's my that's my birthday. I found out we celebrate that we celebrated that together, although 1922, I had a few more years before I was born. He was born in Minneapolis to Harry, an insurance agent, and Esther, a homemaker. Both of them were born in Sweden. Now, Larry Munson went to Moorhead State Teachers College, and then he served in the military, and after his discharge in World War II, enrolled in broadcasting school. He landed his first job in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, and after several short-term jobs, he ended up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And it's interesting that his audition tape for that job was of him calling an Ohio State and Minnesota football game where he provided canned crowd noise and special effects, a talent that would come in handy as he called Nashville Vols road games over the radio while he was in the Sofordale press box reading the ticker tape reports. And he would pretend that a ball was being hit by taking his pencil and hitting it against the microphone. Munson had been named announcer of Nashville Vols games for radio station WKDA in 1947, the first time since 1943 Nashville's home and road games were to be broadcast. But on Sunday, June the 13th, 1948, Nashville split a doubleheader with New Orleans, winning the nightcap 5-1 to one after losing the opener 8-6. to six. So the news was bad, good, and then it got bad. Not only did the local ball team split the two-game set, but something happened that every sportscaster dreads. Radio announcer Larry Munson said a bad word on the air, something about something about the way to make a living. When the manager of the radio station suspended him, it was for the unintentional use of unacceptable language during a baseball game. And here's the quote in the newspaper. Manager T.B. Baker, for whom Munson works, said last night that Munson was suspended immediately and the suspension would continue pending further official action or protests. The Federal Communications Commission indicated that the station's action was acceptable and no formal complaints had been filed. The quote goes on to say, this station has received a few complaints and several times as many requests for Munson's reinstatement. You remember, he was very, very popular in Nashville. Munson's break followed his broadcast of the New Orleans Nashville game when he thought his microphone had been disconnected. Now, it didn't appear that local sports writers wanted to criticize either the ball club, the radio station, or Munson, as there does not appear to be backlash in the newspapers. However, there was a mention of the support for Munson by newspaper Red O'Donnell in his Top of the Morning column when he said many citizens hope sportscaster Larry Munson will be reinstated. And a few days later wrote, 
FCC plans no rap against Larry Munson, suspended WKDA sportscaster. Now, if you haven't seen the local public broadcasting station, WNPT, they have this great production of Memories of Sulphurdale. It was produced back in 2006. It was released in 2007. If you want to see that, go to their website and be sure to donate and choose a copy of that as your gift. It contains great segments of Munson. And the producer and director, Justin Harvey, told me he was wanting to interview Munson. And he looked up in the phone book in Athens, Georgia, where he was at the time. He answered the phone and agreed to an interview. And I asked in a text message a few days ago if Justin, if he was able to uh, tape any of that audio or video of what maybe Munson had said. And he said Larry was reluctant to talk about that when I interviewed him, though he did tell some other colorful stories that didn't make it into the show. Now, Munson continued to call ball games at Sulphurdale for the Nashville Vols. And in 1953, WKDA signed with several Middle Tennessee radio stations to carry those broadcasts. And Nashville banner writer Eddie Jones wrote about Munson's work. And he said, and speaking of Munson, this season, as every season we've heard him, he's giving the sharpest play-by-play work in these parts. Very, very fine. But not everyone agreed. When attendance was woeful in a series of games at Sulphurdale in early May, sports writer Raymond Johnson posed the question in his May 11th, 1953, One Man's Opinion column, and it led by what has happened to interest among fans in Nashville. Nashville was not doing very well at the gate, and it was a surprise because weather had been good and attendance was had trailed what had been going on the previous seasons. And so Johnson wrote in his newspaper column, he invited fans to write to tell him their reasons. As many of the responses complained of the condition of Sulphurdale or the cost of admission or an unpopular manager, Hugh Poland, there was one who signed his letter, a fan, didn't put his name, just wrote a fan. That's not good. He should have written his name. But he blamed Munson. And here's what he wrote. Mr. Munson is one of the very few radio men I ever heard who favored a home club so much. When the Vols are winning, he praises to the limit. And when they are losing, he sings the blues and makes every known excuse. He never gives a visiting club credit due them. Well, I thought that's what a broadcaster did. (laughs) Anyway, after the Vols and WKDA ended their broadcast agreement, Munson began to appear on TV as a sports desk reporter on WSIX TV, and he even began an outdoor show, possibly the very first one ever televised, and he spun records on WSIX radio. He continued to call Vanderbilt basketball and football games for a time, but his big break came in 1966 when he was named one of the announcers for the Atlanta Braves in their first season since moving from Milwaukee. The job lasted one year. As it was reported, Munson and Milo Hamilton did not see eye to eye. But it was fate which landed him his next gig. He saw during spring training that there was going to be an opening at the University of Georgia as their radio announcer was going to retire. He got the job and became play-by-play announcer for the Georgia Bulldogs, where he became a legend with his sayings, We just stepped on their face with a hobnailed boot and broke their news. We just crushed their face. And another was hunker down. And in addition to football, he called Bulldogs basketball games. And he even called Atlanta football games from 1989 to 1992. Now, in 2009, he was inducted into the National Sports Writers Hall of Fame. And he passed away on November the 20th, 2011, in Athens, Georgia. Now, his road to infamy may be found in Georgia. But I'll tell you, his skills were honed in a small press box overlooking home plate at Sulphurdale. Now, I've got a picture that I've been posting on Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to post it on baseballinnashville.com, or you can get there by going to sulphurdale.com. And it'll just be a lone picture of a microphone on a microphone stand. And I want to tell you the story behind that. It really inspired me to write this story and tell you about Larry Munson. A few years ago, I had an email, a long-lost email. I'm sorry that I've lost it because I can't tell who gave it to me, who sent it to me. But it was a man who said his father owned an electrical company, and they did all the sound systems for Sulphurdale back in the 50s. And he said, I've got something you might be interested in. He asked if he could come to my home, and I agreed after 
you know, we talked for a little while longer. He knocked on my door and he didn't want to come in, but he handed me something. It was a mic stand. And he told me that it came out of Sulfordale, out of the ballpark, out of the press box. Now, I have to trust him. I think it was Myers Electric. I'm not positive, but for some reason that name stuck with me. But on the base, it has a piece of white masking tape, now yellowed, and written in pen or marker. It's faded out a little bit, but it's at one time said Nashville Ballpark. Now, I don't think anybody would fake that. He said it sat on a shelf at his shop. His dad had passed, and he thought I'd be interested in it and would like for me to have it. And of course, I'm elated. Well, my nephew, David Nipper, who produces these uh, episodes, uh, also works for K-Love and does the same thing for them, the Christian radio station. And he took a look at this, and he got it, got the mic to work. And I am uh, talking to you on that microphone right now. And I can't tell you that it wasn't just a PA microphone. I can't tell you that it wasn't the radio broadcast microphone. But it looks similar to one that I see from 1951, I think, in a picture in my book, Baseball in Nashville, where Jim Turner is being given a Jim Turner day at Nashville, at Sulphurdale, when the New York Yankees came to town. And I think that's real special. You can call me out on it. You can tell me that that's not it. But I think it is. And I'm going to go with that. So if you, if you enjoy listening to, I'm no, I'm no Larry Munson. But I'll tell you, I have enjoyed talking to you right now on this microphone that came out of Sulphurdale Ballpark, and I'll continue to use it as I can. I'm grateful that you would listen. If you have some idea, some question, something you want me to talk about, research for you, you can contact me at 262downright at gmail.com. I am always grateful that you would listen in, and I hope you'll come back again soon. Thank you.